Well, let's go ahead and get into the Word of God. Uh, we're excited to celebrate Father's Day, and we're excited to celebrate the men in the house, the men of God, these fathers, these surrogate biological, spiritual fathers, these men who've come through a whole lot. And I just want to say up front how excited, something special happens when men gather together. The Bible says how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. And I want to make an announcement to our congregation. I'm just coming back from a pastor's retreat and there were about 80 of us, uh, all men gathered together and something happened to me in that environment. And I became under conviction that God really wants to do something significant. And so we're going to be focusing and uh, supporting our men here in the congregation, in our community. We're gonna be lifting up our brothers. We're gonna be celebrating them. We're gonna be working real hard to make sure that we are the men that we need to be. And let me just throw this out here real quick to any sister who's about to get in her feelings, thinking I'm trying to put you down. I'm not trying to put you down. I'm trying to raise brothers up because I think the best thing I can do to defeat patriarchy is to help develop men who are sound and healthy and spiritual and family focused and excited about their faith. I think that the strong the stronger these brothers get, the stronger we are as men, the better we'll be as husbands, the better we'll be as fathers, the better we are as fathers and husbands, the better the family will be, the better the family is, the better the community is going to be, the better the community is, the better our nation is going to be because they're going to have to deal with us differently. Everybody knows this. It's just the truth. You act different when there's a man in the house. When, when you know that there's a man in the house, stuff goes down a little different. And when our nation sees that this race is not without male leadership and not without men who are committed to our families and to our communities, they're going to treat us differently. And so we're going to be focusing in on men unapologetically because we want to be what God wants us to be. Now listen, if our church was 70% uh, men and 30% women, then I'd be focusing on the women, but we're gonna focus on the men because we wanna make sure that we are the men that God has called us to be. I'm excited about what God is doing even right now. Let's go ahead and go before the mercy seat and throne of God together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we bless you, we praise you, we honor and adore you for who you are and for your goodness and mercy towards us. I thank you for every man on this Father's Day. I thank you for who you've called us to be, God. I pray that we might discover what godly manhood looks like. That God, we will not allow the culture to dictate and to define us, but we will find ourselves in you and in your word. And so for that purpose, God, I pray that you might speak and that you might move and that you might pour out your spirit, that you might stir the gifts that are within us and that you might do a miraculous work. Even so, that the anointing that falls on these men will overflow to their families and to their communities and to their businesses and to their jobs. And wherever you have placed them, cause them to stand to show themselves to be a man of God, a man of valor, a man of war, a man of integrity. In the name of Jesus, do a new thing in us and we'll give you the glory. It's in Jesus' name we want to say thank you. All God's children said, amen, amen, amen. All right, brothers, let's work it out. Grab your Bible, turn with me to 2 Samuel, the 23rd chapter, beginning reading in the 13th verse. 2 Samuel, the 13th chapter, beginning reading in the 13th verse, and there these words are recorded. During harvest time, three of the 30 chief warriors came down to David at the cave of Adullam, while a band of Philistines was encamped in the valley of Rephaim. At that time, David was in the stronghold, and the Philistine garrison was at Bethlehem. David longed for water and said, Oh, that someone would get me a drink of water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem. So the three mighty warriors broke through the Philistine lines, drew water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem and carried it back to David. But he refused to drink it. Instead, he poured it out before the Lord. Far be it from me, the Lord, from me to do this. He said, is not the blood of men who went at the risk of their lives. Is it not the blood of men who went at the risk of their lives. And David would not drink it. Such were the exploits of the three mighty warriors. Thus far, 
the Word of God. As we continue today in the series of sermons we've been sharing throughout the month of June entitled uh, The Waterway, tonight we want to just use as a sermonic subject, I'm going to get a drink. I'm going to get a drink. Amen. Y'all, let's tell the truth. Men are different. I ain't going to go there. Men are different. In order to prove it, just turn on your television and look at the view and then look at inside the NBA. The view has a studio audience so that when the panel of sisters is up there discussing whatever topic it is and sharing their ideas and opinions and viewpoints and emotions, the audience is there to clap back and to, and to, to laugh with them and, and to cry with them and to emote and to engage with them because women are relational. Men, eh, not so much. I mean, turn on the inside NBA, ain't no studio audience. It's just four brothers doing what we do sitting around talking smack, and they get paid well for it. They're sitting around debating, because debate really is nothing but verbal uh, violence. They, they, they are doing what brothers do, joke around, pranks, right? And, and at the end of the day, uh, they have two cats, you know, Shaq and Charles, that they have to keep on opposite ends. <laughs> they love each other, but it could go another way. Men, we're just different. Uh, I mean, a man doesn't ever say to another man, listen, dog, I just saw this movie and I cried three times. <laughs> Said no brother ever. See, see, a sister will say that and, and the other sister says, oh, wow, it must have really been touching. I can't wait to see it. See, see, brothers, it's not that we don't have feelings. It's not that we can't cry or should be ashamed to cry. It's just that crying is not a goal for the day. If we can get through the day without tears, it was a good day. So, so we don't see tears as an endorsement because we're men and, well, we're different. Uh, you, you don't generally see two dudes just sitting there in a room talking. We got to have some kind of activity. We either shooting at the range or golfing or bowling or at least eating, at least got the TV on. With, got, there has to be something else going on because that's just how we are. Now, you can walk into a room with a bunch of sisters and there's no TV on, there's no music, they just, and they're just having a wonderful time. And that's great, but, you know, in all fairness, just understand, sisters, we're just a little different. And, and y'all, please be in prayer for Sister Shauna, because I think I have just so frustrated her. You know, so many times, you know, she'll you know, come to me after I've been hanging out with my colleagues and say, you know, what did y'all talk about? When I tell her, she's just so disappointed. Like, y'all are college-educated <laughs> leaders. That's all y'all got? You know, but yeah, pretty much. I mean, w w did you ask him? No. What did he tell you about? No. What did y'all talk about? No. What would y'all talk about? Nothing. <laughs> For five hours? Yeah, it was great. <laughs> it's, it's what we do. It's just, it's, we're different. It's not better, it's not worse, it's just different. You know, one of my favorite movies of all time is Bill Duke's uh, cinematic masterpiece, Hoodlum. Y'all remember that? And uh, there's this one scene where uh, Lawrence Fishburne, who's playing the, the epic Harlem gangster Bumpy Johnson, is now at war with Dutch Schultz, and he's about to make a major move. And at this particular point, he gets about as close as men normally get to really sharing how he feels. He says to his boy Philadelphia, he says, listen, there's some things a man can't do by himself. I need my man hard down with his boots laced up. He doesn't say I'm scared. He doesn't say I'm nervous. He doesn't say I don't know if I can go through with it. That, that would be right, but he just, he doesn't talk like that. He just says I need my man hard down with boots. That's, that's how we are, we're different. And, and it's not that we are putting down how, how women talk, it's just that we don't have all the tools the sisters have. We know scientifically that sisters speak about 25,000 words a day. Men typically speak about 15,000 words. So sisters, by the time we get home, it's not that we're not trying to talk, it's just we out. <laughs> we, we already, you know what I'm saying, everything we got to say. I mean, we, we don't, no, more seriously, we don't have the vocabulary to express. We don't have the emotional inventory to even be aware of what we're going on. We try to think our, ourselves to be more logical and rational, but the truth of the matter is, we just didn't get that many colors in our crayon box. 
Y'all got like the 64 box, we got the eight. <laughs> and so just, just deal with us gently. We, you, you, we're, we're working with, with, with some difficulty. See, see, what I'm trying to get at is that we typically as men uh, don't express ourselves as we should. And a great example of that is the text that I read into your hearing tonight, wherein we find David in this messed up situation. The Bible says that David finds himself, like so many times before, on the run. He and his boys have now taken up camp uh, in the cave of Adullam. The Bible says that David is there in the stronghold, and in this moment, he says something, and I want you to hear through what he says to what he really means. The Bible says that David said, I wish that I had a drink from the well at Bethlehem. Now, you have to remember the Philistines have taken over the land and there is a garrison of soldiers that have encamped in Bethlehem. And, and he's saying, I'm thirsty and I want to drink, but not just any drink. I want to drink from that water. And the Bible says when three of his mighty warriors hear what their king says, upon themselves, they take it upon themselves to bust through the lines and go to Bethlehem to the well to fill up a skin of water and bring it back to David. And the Bible says when David sees what they've done, he takes the water, but he doesn't drink it. Instead, the Bible says he pours it out as a libation to the Lord, saying, I should not drink the blood of these men because they went at the risk of their lives to get me water. So, so brothers, that's what happened. And with your permission, I'd like to spend just the rest of our time talking about why it happened. So, so first of all, let me point out something very simple, which is that in Scripture, uh, water is symbolic, watch this, of spiritual status. So, so in, in Scripture, water is representative of, of the Spirit, which also means when there is a lack of water, it signifies the fact that there is a spiritual drought. So, so you recall when uh, Joseph's brothers set him up and stripped off his uh, coat of many colors and threw him down the pit. The Bible gives us a great description. The Bible says, and the pit had no water in it. Yeah. That, that means not only is, is Joseph in physical danger, but he also spiritually is in the depth of his life. You, you do recall, don't you, how uh, the Bible says that Isaac goes to reclaim the wells of his father, Abraham, but finds that there are some people that, watch this, have filled in the wells. And that's some kind of hate, because if I fill in a wall, well, that means I can't even drink from it. Yeah. And, and the Bible says that, that Isaac finds himself in a situation where even when he digs wells, then they come and steal and take them from him. He, he's not just in physical and financial trouble. He's in spiritual trouble. You recall how, how when Elijah uh, is called to speak against Ahab and Jezebel because of their heresy in Israel, the Bible says that for three years, God shuts up the rain on the land so that neither dew nor raindrop falls upon the earth. And then finally, Elijah goes and prays seven times. And the Bible says at the seventh time, his servant looks up and sees the cloud the size of a man's hand. And Elijah says, let's come on and get ready because I hear the sound of a rushing rain, which really means that God is about to restore the fortune of Israel because the rain, the water is symbolic of God's spirit and God's power and God's blessing. So think about it. Even today, when you talk to somebody, they'll talk about being in a dry season, being in a drought. But that doesn't mean much to us because we take water for granted. Think about it. I mean, we, 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 we wash our cars and clothes and don't think nothing about it, wash our dishes. And, and I pray we wash ourselves. It's, it's the brothers group. And um, we, we, uh, we, we, we water our lawns. But, but you have to understand that in an arid d desert region, like where the Bible is being written, water is life. But I want you to understand that, that David's request for water from the well is about so much more than water. See, again, we are, David ain't just going out and say, listen, y'all, my heart is broken. I, I've been fighting this fight too long. He just says, I want to drink from over there. And, and sisters, can I help y'all real quick? Because understand that men are often more physical than we are verbal. 
So, so, so you got to understand how to read us and hear us. So, so, so when, when, when he goes and without you asking him, takes your car in to, make, to get it service or does the work himself, yeah, you could say, well, you know, he's just doing his job. But understand that when he does it with you, are not asking him. He's showing you that he loves you. He's showing you that he's interested in your safety. He's showing you that he wants to protect you and the family. Yeah, you could say he's just doing what he's supposed to do, but don't rob yourself of the message he's sending you. David said, I want to drink from the well. It, it was like it was like Bumpy Johnson saying, I need my man hard down with my boots laced. That there's something going on in here, and I can't really give words to it. Now, now remember, we're talking about King David. That David, who who the Psalms, most of the Psalms are ascribed to. So, and if you read the Psalms, you'll you'll agree with me that that is some of the most emotional writing we find in Scripture. So it's not that David doesn't have words, but every now and then you can be in a season where words leave you, where you are not in a place where you can express it. Maybe as a leader, maybe as a man, he doesn't feel comfortable exposing his vulnerability any further. But thank God, spirit knows spirit and the brothers know what is going on with him. And, and so the brothers decide to take it upon themselves to help him out because they recognize that when he says, I need a drink, he really is expressing a spiritual and mental and emotional and psychological and sociological pain that he doesn't have words to give to right now. And that's why I believe they went forward. They went to get that brother some water because they've been where he is. They recognize drought when they see it. They recognize spiritual thirst when they see it. And that's why it takes men to disciple men. It takes men to disciple men. I'm going to say it one more time. It takes men to disciple men because we recognize the signs of the struggle. Game recognize game. And we can speak to some stuff that other folks don't know the code to. The water... For, for David was, was personal. And there, going to get the water was an expression, watch this, of love. But, but then secondarily, watch this. The, the water, some scholars say, may have been a symbol of David's vision for Jerusalem. Because to think about it, if he's saying, I would that I could have the water in Bethlehem, what he's really saying is, I wish we weren't in this situation. I, I, I wish that the tribes had come together and that the Philistines had not gotten the best of us. I, I wish that we were not living in peril and under their mercy. I wish that, that we were living in power as a people, as God has called us to live. Are you hearing me? And I believe that may have, if they heard how David said it that way, that would have inspired some brothers to go get a drink. But because watch this, a man is never more of a man than when he is aligned with vision and purpose and mission and an assignment and a calling and a destiny. You never feel more of a man than when you understand who you are and what God has called you to. Yeah. Oh, no. OK. You, you, you know, a lot of times sisters call us dogs. but You got to understand even in dogs, there are different categories. And one category of dogs are called working group, is the working group. That's the guard dog. That's the sled dog. That dog ain't happy unless he got an assignment. That that dog ain't happy. He wants to pull something. He wants to guard something. He wants to herd something. He needs to understand that when I wake up this morning, I'm not just walking around chasing my tail. I have an assignment and a purpose to live out. That you've got to understand as a man, when you understand who you are and who you are in God, it begins to give you focus and gives, gives you determination and drive. It forces you to get out of bed and go fight one more day. They say this is bigger than us. It's about our people. It's about our family. It's about our future. It's about our finances and our fortune. It's about who God has called us to be. It's about our faith. And brothers, can't nobody handle you when you get locked in to what God has. I ain't talking about what they putting on BET and what they putting on. Instagram, I'm talking about when you line up with God's assignment for your life, you are a weapon of mass destruction to the devil. 
you, you got to have purpose. You got to have passion. You got to have a sense of your mission and your ministry, your calling and your career, your assignment and your anointing. You got to have something bigger than stuff. I mean, don't get me wrong. Everybody should have some healthy habits. And hobbies, you, you should you should enjoy going to the golf course and hitting the bucket of balls. You, you should enjoy uh, cleaning the car on the weekend and making sure that thing is shining right. But don't confuse hobbies with the anointing of God. Don't don't waste your life over stuff that comes with a receipt, because if it comes with a receipt, it ain't going to fulfill you. It ain't going to last. It's not going to give you who you are. That stuff is empty and it will leave you empty. I mean, I'm a car guy, but, but, but I understand at the end of the day, no matter how fast I can go from zero to 60, the question is, I, is where am I going? You see some cats, they just ride around all day because they ain't got nowhere to go. Nothing to do and no one to serve. Man is never more powerful when he has purpose. And, and, and let's, let's, let's be honest. Since y'all understand, we really don't need much. I mean, again, kind of like dogs, just feed us, put in the backyard, we'd be all right. Yeah. I mean, three, three hots in a cot. Yeah. Shoot. Three coals in a stone, we'll make it. <laughs> I mean, we, we don't need that much. But we, what we do need is something to drive us. Yeah. We need something that requires us to get up early before the sun comes up. We need something that requires us to get prepared and to plan. We, we, we feel strong when, when we know that there are people depending on us, that their stakes are high and that there's something riding on this. We're looking to demonstrate our manhood and prove who we are. And, and that's why if you look at the, the Bible, that's why Jesus calls 12 men who are all doing something. He, he don't just call 12 shiftless, aimless, aimless brothers on the corner talking smack, doing nothing. Everybody, every man he calls is already busy, already has a job, already has an assignment. And what he says is, listen, you have a purpose, but I'm going to give you a higher purpose. Most of y'all are fishers, but I'm going to make you fishers of men. I'm going to I'm going to elevate you. I'm going to promote you. And brothers, I appreciate you high, climbing high on the corporate ladder. I appreciate the fact you getting your second PhD. All oh, that's great. But understand your best and highest use is always in the kingdom of God. For only what you do for Christ will last. That David is saying, I want some water. And these three brothers stood up and said, I'll get it. I'll get you a drink. And, and, and hear this, brothers, brothers. What I want you to see is that as men of God, those who have been redeemed, we recognize that Jesus is trying to give us his purpose. See, David said, I thirst. But didn't Jesus say that on the cross? And, and he, he, he wasn't just thirsty for water. I mean, yeah, he had been hanging there and physiologically he, he was thirsty, but it was a bigger statement than that. He was thirsty for souls. That's why he gave his life. He was thirsty for righteousness. That's why, men, we can't live like everybody else. He was thirsty to see his kingdom built on earth as it is in heaven. And we're supposed to be the builders. Men, are you hear what I'm saying? That, that on this Father's Day, God allows us the honor to be known by his position. Okay, when Jesus taught them the Lord's Prayer, he said, and when you pray, pray like this, say, Abba, Father. So, so, so sisters, this is why men, we got to get together and work on ourselves, because look at our job description. We're supposed to be called what we call God. Abba, Father, that's some weight. That's some responsibility. You, you want to see what kind of man you are Measure yourself on the Abba Father scale. Because, because in order to, to be on that scale, you got to take some risk. You, you got to risk giving your money and feeling like you're being played. 
You know how we are. What they going to do. But you want the contract. And to be trusted. It's okay. You, you want to feel like my service matters, but what happens when nobody comes and says thank you? What happens when you're there to lock up the building and nobody's there to applaud you? You got to know that your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Are you hearing what I'm saying? That, 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 father, that father thing, that, that takes some weight. The Bible says the men brought the water and watch this. Here's the part and I'm done. The Bible says they brought him the water, they brought him his drink, and he refused to drink it. He refused to drink it because he saw the cost of the water. He, he said, if I drink this water, it's like drinking your blood because you risked your life to get me a drink. You, you risked your life to, to support me and to encourage me. You saw as your leader, I was broken and bruised and you were willing to put your life on the line. Yeah. The, the truth of the matter is, brothers, that, that, that God has called us to, to be men who love. Who he's called us to be men on a mission. But then thirdly and finally, he's called us to be men of courage. God ain't looking for no jelly back men. Brother scared of his own shadow. Yeah, now, now, I know you got 18 degrees and you live in Potomac, but you ain't always lived there. And you remember back in the day, the rule was, if you run, we're going to catch you and find you. And there's going to be some furniture moving. Y'all know what I'm saying? That, 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 that part of manhood is courage. Courage doesn't mean I'm, not, I'm scared. I'm not scared. Courage means I do it anyway. And if you look at the kind of occupations that are typically taken on by men, it's, it's the courageous ones, right? It's firefighters and construction workers and truckers and police persons. These are all brothers who are saying, I'll get you a drink. I'll put myself in harm's way. I'll put my life on the line. And that should inspire you because Jesus said that's what he's looking for. Okay, let me quote him. He said, no greater man, greater love has a man than this than to lay down his life for his friend. That at the end of the day, when I'm willing to sacrifice myself, that's the best thing that I can do to show you I love you. That's why Paul says, uh, husbands, love your wives as Christ loves the church and gave himself for her. Christ died for, now the first part of that of course is, uh, wives submit to your husbands. I know you don't like the first part. But if you want the second part, they kind of go together. <laughs> now we will remind you that verse 21 of that passage says submit to one another. So this is not about domination. This is about meeting the need of the individual. Women need love. And they need to be felt, they need to feel secure in that love. Men need honor, that they are regarded as leader. And when he gives what she needs, and when she gives what he needs, then you have what people look for in marriage. But we come looking to get what we want, but not given what is needed. Are we still friends? Are we still friends? Uh, I, I'm done, but, but I, I, I love this passage because, because watch this. David refuses to drink. Look what he does. He says, I can't drink this because it's like drinking the blood uh, of these men. And the Bible says then he pours it out on the ground. Watch this. As a libation to the Lord. He says the only one that deserves that kind of loyalty, that kind of sacrifice is God. That, 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 that when you show that kind of commitment and that kind of determination, that's godly living. And, and brothers, the good news is Jesus died for us. He shed his blood for us. And I can follow that kind of man. I, I can't follow a man that's willing to die for what he believes. And I can follow a man who can be innocent and die for me in my guilt. 
I, I can follow a man who has power to call down angels, but refuses and continues to suffer and take the hits in order to save my life. I can follow a man who loves me even when I reject him. I, I can follow a man who's willing to shed his blood in order to purchase my salvation. You want to know I love Jesus? Because he showed me he loved me. He showed me his mission. He showed me his courage on a hill called Calvary. One Friday when they hung him high and stretched him wide and he hung his head and the locks of the shoulders and he died and he shed his blood. That blood came down from Calvary's cross and covered my salvation. Brothers, I come to tell you there's power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. I, I can't speak for any man in here, but I tell you for me, I need a drink. Come, come on, lift your hands in the sanctuary. Father, here we are. Your sons, your servants. Here we are, men aspiring to be men of God. God, I pray that you will break the chains and strongholds on our minds, on our hearts and our spirits that this world has placed on us to make us slaves. Slaves to drink and drugs, slaves to money and material possession, slaves to sexual conquest and sexual identity. Help us to understand before any of that, we're more than all of that. You've called us to be your disciples. You've given us the honor of being called Father. And God, we publicly acknowledge we're not equal to the task. We can't fulfill this job description on our own, but by faith, we know that with you, all things are possible. And so I pray for every man under the sound of my voice. I pray for all those who line up under his covering. I pray, God, that he will walk worthy of the calling to which he has been called. Pray that you might use him to show others to the foot of the cross. That you might show him who he is in you that you might stir up the gifts that are within him, that you might use him for your glory. God, give him your mission. And give him faith to fulfill it in Jesus' name. Come on, put your hands together, brothers, if you believe that, if you agree with that. Listen, I, I want to extend the invitation for salvation at the end of the day. I don't care how much you can bench press. I don't care how much you got in the bank unless there is blood over your life. When your time on earth is over, your time in eternity won't be with God. But I've got good news. Salvation is available right now. All you need to do is reach out to the number that appears on your screen. Within a matter of minutes, one of our leaders will reach out to you, pray with you, show you the word of God, what salvation is all about. And you'll know that the blood of Jesus covers your life. Come be saved today. And if you don't have a church home you're growing, well, I'll tell you this, you're going to get the real at this church. You, you'll get real teaching, real word, and you'll grow in real faith. If you don't have a church home, I'd love to be your pastor. We'd love to be your church. And if you're in a backslidden condition, no shame. The shame is not falling. The shame is not getting back up. And sometimes you need some help. And so our leaders are here to pray restoration in your life. If you need to be saved, if you need to join the church, if you need to be restored, reach out to that number and watch God do a new thing in your life. Come on, brothers, put your hands together. Let's thank God for what God is doing even right now.